1997, on a Saturday morning, there was a fire in the Aisin Seiki plant number one. In, uh, this was Toyota's plant in Japan that made a $5 part, something called a P-valve. Now, I don't know what a P-valve is, but apparently you need one to make a car. It's one of one part out of about 20,000 different parts in a car. And this plant that burned down made 200 variations of P valves. Gone. Experts said it would take six months to rebuild that plant. 14,000 cars a day that Toyota was making stopped being made in about four hours because, you know, they're Toyota, lean, they only have so many parts on hand. They don't have warehouses full of P valves. And yet, it didn't take six months to reopen the plant or start the Toyota lines. It took five days. And this was not a miracle. What Toyota had was an ecosystem of suppliers and distributors who, before the embers were even cold on that Saturday morning, started faxing each other blueprints for P-valves. There was a sewing machine manufacturer who retooled over 500 hours and started making P-valves one, five, ten at a time. And by that Thursday, trucks started pulling in from all around with all kinds of P-valves. What Toyota had is exactly the opposite of what we have in healthcare today. <laughs> And so you don't get surprised when you see what we have and we wonder why we have a $2.7 trillion perfectly designed healthcare delivery system, perfectly designed to deliver health care, not to design, uh, deliver health. Two and a half years ago, when I started in New York uh, with Governor Cuomo, we had the same problem that everyone's facing, rising costs, not enough money, empty beds in hospitals, discoordinated care, no patient-centered care to speak of. Our budget was growing 13% every year, one-third of the state budget, and crowding out education, crowding out everything else that we wanted to make investments in. Same problem everyone had. The governor called together this Medicaid redesign team, and he put 27 people around the room, around the table union leaders, hospital management, patient advocates, legislators. We went around the whole state for two months getting all sorts of ideas on how do we fix Medicaid. And we got 4,000 ideas. We boiled them down to about 250 that we thought were the most workable put to ideas together and then had a vote. And for you clinical scholars, I learned something from, from Bob Brook. It was called a modified RAND Delphi approach, which no one understands, right? And we said, we're going we're to use a modified RAND Delphi approach to vote on these 250 ideas. And at the end of the day, you come out with ideas. And you know, no one actually agreed on any of them. You, you wouldn't expect them to. But when you put relative agreement instead of agreement, and you put green yellow, red for one-third of the ideas, one-third of the ideas, one-third of the ideas. You put an ugly name like modified Delphi Rand approach and a little asterisk that says relative agreement. 78 of the ideas they agreed on relatively. Oh, we agreed. I guess we have to sign on. And so everyone took a big haircut. Hospitals, unions, providers, patients, everyone. The beauty of the approach was you could have come up with probably those 79 ideas on your own, but coming up with 4,000 ideas, boiling it down, coming to consensus, and saying, these are your ideas, these aren't my ideas. You, you wanted these, you agreed to them, let's do them. And overnight, we cut the growth rate for Medicaid in the state of New York from 13% to 4%. That represents a $4.6 billion savings in the first year, 
and on track, and we've capped it there, it's never going beyond 4%, it's going to save us $34 billion as taxpayers over five years. What were those ideas? Well, why don't we increase the generic substitution rate? Well, that's $425 million of savings annually. Why don't we hire a transportation manager in Brooklyn where the Russian mafia controls the ambulettes and they make up hundreds of fake ambulette visits shuttling non-existent patients to and from non-existent visits and homes? Hundreds of millions of dollars in savings, a few death threats against my staff, really, but it works. Why don't we, do people really need 18 hours of grocery shopping per day as part of home care? Per day? <laughs> Probably not. We just looked at the data and said these are the kinds of things we could work on. One of my favorites was Medicaid pays for everything under the sun in New York. You know, We paid for growth hormone shots for children with idiopathic short stature syndrome. What does that mean? Idiopathic means they have normal growth hormone le levels and we're paying tens of thousands of dollars to give them growth hormone shots so that at the end of the day instead of being five foot five they could be five foot seven. I'm fine with five foot five. We stopped paying for it. <laughs> right? Makes sense. On the other hand, we weren't paying for a lot of things we should have been paying for. Ever, anyone heard of the US PSTF grade A and B recommendations? You know, things that are pretty vetted, approved by some good people out there. Medicaid wasn't paying for all of the US PSTF grade A and B recommendations. So let's stop throwing money away in things that we don't want to spend in and start putting money in on places we know we should be spending money. Time and again, so many examples like this. We today, as you know, have an epidemic of chronic diseases that is uh, overshadowing the epidemic of acute diseases that we, we grew up in uh, decades ago. New York is not different from anyone else. Today, 10.4% of New Yorkers have diabetes. Another 30% are pre-diabetic. And given the way the obesity trends are, those pre-diabetics are going to become diabetic. Today, we actually spend $8.7 billion in New York treating diabetes. I can't imagine tripling that or quadrupling that. Um, we know today that more people worldwide are dying more of problems related to too much food rather than too little food. This includes Africa and everywhere. I think it was... Uh, Dr. Schroeder had a 97 article in Jam New England Journal that showed 60% of preventable mortality is based on our choices, on other social determinants of health. And it's not necessarily our choice where we live, but our zip code does predict more than our uh, genetic code. Our genetic code only predicts 30% of preventable mortality. And that $2.7 trillion juggernaut that is our healthcare delivery system, 10% of preventable mortality. We're spending all that money on things that aren't actually saving lives. So we're trying to get people out of that end stage revolving door of the emergency room where it's too late, they've had the diabetes for years, they haven't had health insurance, and so they end up with a diabetic foot ulcer and straight to amputation and moving them more upstream. In New York, we have one of the most successful health benefit exchanges in the country, a launch that accounts for over a third of all of the country's signups in New York to date. Uh, we're on track to give 1.1 million people an insurance card for the very first time. And you know what that means. That means they'll get preventive care instead of just end stage emergency Medicaid in the hospital care. We're moving things upstream. We're moving things from the hospital to primary care, but ultimately our salvation will come moving things upstream even further from primary care 
to wellness and prevention in the first place. I mean, isn't that all we want? We all want to be healthy, to be able to play with our kids and grandkids, to be able to be productive at the workforce, to not stay home because you have a migraine, but actually you know, do what you want to do. And we can do that. We know we can do that. The Trust for America's Health estimates that if we only spend $10 per person per year in America on prevention, we would save $2.8 billion. We, we, the, the ROI on prevention, the return on investment is just incredible. And example after example can be told. One example that I like is about what's happening at Rikers Island in New York City. We know that these poor inmates are in a revolving door of the justice system, just like the ER. They get out, they commit crime again because there's no opportunities for anything else, and they end up back in. Many of these folks have behavioral health issues, substance abuse issues, and as soon as they get out, you know, there's always that gap in care from what the prison system provides before they get enrolled in something like Medicaid that gets them their meds again. Goldman Sachs decided that they were going to take a bet on these people and pay for behavioral health services in Rikers Island. Group therapy, you know? Let's try to treat their mental illness. And what happens? Recidivism goes down by 15%. When it goes down by 15%, you could put a dollar sign next to that and say, we just saved how much money? And so Goldman gets to keep the savings, right? No state city, anyone has money to put new money into programs, even though we know they're evidence-based, we know we should be doing it. Let Goldman come in, take the risk, build the programs, hold them accountable for the outcomes, and if it works, let them keep half of the savings and put half back in our pockets. So we as a government need to figure out how do we keep that money stream going even though we're not spending it. It's not hard, but you need to do it. So we've committed to doing more of that. We've committed $30 million in our budget this year in New York to improve, to create more social impact bonds. Things like school-based health care. We know that you'll put a nurse in to a school in the inner city with high asthma rates. Teenage pregnancy goes down 47%. And asthma, asthma admissions to the ER drop and every asthma admission is a huge savings to Medicaid. Medicaid should pay for that. We're doing that. We're doing supportive housing. We're doing a few other examples. There's about seven uh, applications we've received and we'll probably release the two that we're going to fund very soon. No money for me. You know, I'm just committing that those streams of funding continue from wherever they're coming and ultimately it's going to save health care Medicaid, money, while, by the way, improving outcomes. So you can achieve that vision of the triple aim. Better care, better quality, lower cost. Part of prevention is trying to strengthen the nodes of the current ecosystem of the healthcare and strengthen the connect connections between the uh, systems in the ecosystem of healthcare. So what am I talking about? Right now, Hospitals, nursing homes, primary care, they never talk to each other really effectively. Patients bounce around with three different problem lists, end up getting readmitted because they're taking a few of those meds and a few of those meds. I've done that my, to my own patients. I've uh, prescribed refills of vitamin D and calcium, and uh, meanwhile they got some other vitamin D and calcium, they're taking twice the dose, they end up admitted. It happens all the time. So. How do, we, how do we strengthen the, the, the connections? Well, one of the ways we can strengthen the connections is investing in care coordination. So for the 5% of patients who are responsible for 50% of our healthcare spend in, the, uh, in America today, those with two or more chronic conditions, the ones who are bouncing around, let's focus on them, let's hotspot, and let's create those connections. Let's call them care coordinators or community health workers 
or navigators. Oh, and the feds are paying for it, by the way, under the Affordable Care Act, 90 cents on the dollar for the first two years. Let's throw as much money as we can on that. It works, right? In my, at uh, Bronx Lebanon Hospital, the second that 911 is called, 911 operators notify that patient's primary care doctor, receiving emergency room, and a community health worker. Because it's all electronic. We have incredible electronic systems now. So before the patient even arrives in the emergency room, the community health worker has made an appointment for the, with the primary doc and is sitting there waiting in the emergency room for the patient to show up and says, Mrs. Jones, would you like to wait here for six more hours? Oh, we have an appointment for you in 10 minutes across the street if you'd rather. Mrs. Jones invariably goes across the street. It works. At Maimonides Medical Center, another uh, one in the Bronx, we have uh, on the electronic health record network across all of the different systems that we have in the state of New York, they've started a system where community health workers and navigators can enter their own data. So they have access, first of all, to the full medication lists of all the patients, the problem lists. But for Mrs. Jones, who has CHF, diabetes, and asthma, the community health worker enters number one on her parallel problem list is domestic violence. Number two is unstable housing. What's causing all those readmissions? It ain't that problem list. It's this one. And now the whole team actually knows what the problems are and can take a team-based approach of getting Mrs. Jones what she needs, which is not something the healthcare delivery system is equipped at all to deliver or has not been. And in a shared savings global capitation model, you're making money by keeping her at home, by keeping her healthy by keeping her well, by keeping that emergency room empty and keeping those hospital beds empty. It's actually happening today, and it's working. So health homes, you know, this care coordination, it's going to take off. Um, it, it already has taken off in some parts. That's connecting the parts of the ecosystem better. Now, how do we strengthen the nodes? Well, we're betting a lot of money on the patient-centered medical home model for the delivery of primary care. For those of you who know this, um, the patient-centered medical home is high-quality primary care. The doc, it works in a team, doesn't lose the patient when they refer to a specialist. They, they, they know what happens to the patient. They create teams and actually meet needs. And depending on the level of the patient-centered medical home, level one, two, three, you're using electronic health records, you have a lot higher quality primary care than just a sole practitioner with a paper-based record uh, working alone uh, uh, can provide. But it also has a name. It's called an NCQA designated level one, level two, level three patient-centered medical home. So what does that mean? That means insurers understand what they're paying for when they're paying for it. We're always talking, oh, why don't you pay for telehealth? Well, I don't know what I'm paying for. It's different in Rochester than it is in Buffalo. But I know what I'm paying for when it's a PCMH, and I'll give $7 if it's a level one, and $12 if it's a level two, and $14 or $20 if it's a level three. And that little amount of money per patient per month adds up very quickly. High quality primary care practices in the Adirondacks, in the central uh, district area around Rochester, uh, around Albany, have all embraced the patient-centered medical home model. And now for three years, they are showing, surprise, surprise, more visits, more primary care being delivered, higher quality primary care delivered, fewer emergency room visits, lower total cost of care. Wow. Of course, this makes sense, right? It, it, it shouldn't be a surprise. High quality primary care works. But if you can figure out how to call it this, you know, what are the ingredients to the recipe of high, primary, uh, high quality primary care versus what is 
you know, what is necessary, what is sufficient, and you can define it in a way that all payers, Medicare, Medicaid, and seven private companies can all give the same rate to that doctor and that practice, it takes off. In New York today, we have one in seven of the country's patient-centered medical homes. 5.1 million Medicaid members will be receiving care in a high-quality patient-centered medical home by the end of next year. It's, again, not rocket science. We know we, what we need to do, and we're doing it. And we're bringing everyone along, and we're seeing the results of it. So prevention works. Primary care works. Building out the strong nodes of the ecosystem, connecting the dots, it works. What are we doing with the hospitals? The hospitals in New York, 220 hospitals, are all not-for-profit. We don't have any for-profit hospitals. So as part of the Affordable Care Act, not-for-profit hospitals, on their Schedule H's of their Form 990's, have to describe why they deserve to be not-for-profit. What are they doing for the community? What is their community benefit plan? About 10% of hospital profits gross are going toward community benefit today across the country. Now if you look at that 10%, where is it actually going? Half of it is going as write-offs for charity care. Is that community benefit or keeping the four walls of the hospital full? I would argue it's not community benefit. Another third is going toward resident education and training. Well, yes, we need you to be trained and all, but that's not community benefit either. And at the end of the day, if you actually look at the definitions, David Kindig has done some great work in this, the actual community benefit that hospitals provide based on their nonprofit status across the country is 0.4%. We're giving them how many taxpayer write-offs? For 0.4% community benefit? That's unacceptable. And so what I'm doing is, number one, I've mandated that today, November 15th, every hospital in the state of New York has to give me their community benefit plan, and I have to approve it. And I'm only going to approve it if they pick two things on my five-point prevention agenda. You know, not rocket science. Work on women, infants, children's health. Work on it's, it's basic public health. Two points out of that that they're going to work on, and they're going to have measurable gains over time. Oh, and by the way, did they work with their local public health? Did they work with the nonprofits in their community? And if they didn't, go back, start over, if you want to keep your nonprofit status. Now, I don't expect change overnight. Maybe that 0.4% becomes 1%. That 1% becomes 2%. But incremental change over time can really add up. And so maybe I'll publish those community benefit plans on the internet so everyone can see them. I think that's a good idea. <laughs> Let me turn then to transparency, because transparency is a fun area too. Two decades uh, in. Uh, yeah, two decades ago in New York, we, we collected data on all the cardiac surgeries, outcomes related to cardiac surgeries. They were all over the map. There were doctors who were incredibly talented, and you know, one patient out of 100 had any sort of complication, and there were others where half the people were dying in 30 days. And a reporter decided to file a Freedom of Information Act request. We had to release all the data. And what happened? A lot of doctors went out of business because they were really killing people, about five, about five to eight percent. Some really good people kept doing whatever they were doing. And the vast majority who were complaining that, oh, you know what, this is going to lead to adverse selection, I'm not going to take any hard cases, this is going to confuse patients, they're not going to know. None of that happened, by the way. The vast majority went to their friends at the high-performing institutions and said, what are you doing? How can we learn from you? And today, New York State has the best in the country average outcomes in cardiac surgery because of that transparency. 
it works. So two and a half years ago when Hurricane Irene was bowling toward New York City and we were expecting a 20 foot sur storm surge and dozens of nursing homes had to evacuate over a weekend, we had just by chance a month before released the most boring data set we collect, the weekly nursing home bed census data. And all these nursing home operators on their own went to our website, saw the nursing home bed vacancies, and moved their patients out of harm's way. Transparency matters. We love that. I said, let's do more. Let's create a website on an open API platform so anyone can get the data in real time easily on important things. Baby names. <laughs> One of our most popular data sets. See how Brittany trends up and down over time. <laughs> um, pediatric weight status by school district. You know, I've been getting attacks left and right of folks who want to abandon the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act nutrition guidelines that are a few years old because it costs too much and the kids throw the good food away and you know, it's, we can't afford it. On the other hand, when you publish all the data at the school district level for over 680 school districts in the state of New York over time, and reporters have nice graphs they can create on our website in real time saying, why does Niskayuna have a 10% pediatric obesity rate and Albany Central have a 25% pediatric obesity rate? And then they go to the schools and start you know, going through the cafeteria lines. I got dozens of phenomenal stories that are helping us really engage folks in the debate around pediatric obesity just by releasing data that we're sitting on. And we've been sitting on for years in our files. We released all of our restaurant inspection data. And Yelp called us up and said, we're going to put this on our Yelp ratings so that when people see that B rating, they can see there were cockroaches in your inspection last month. <laughs> what does that B really mean? Great. I want to know that as a consumer, and I use Yelp. Fine. And we have 300 other data sets like that. Next week, we're releasing a week, week and a half. So how many of you have read Bitter Pill in Time magazine? OK, there was an article about why does a colonoscopy cost $300 here and $3,000 there. CMS, the feds, released data on 100 conditions that came up with that article. Next week, I'm releasing data on 1,400 conditions for every hospital in the state of New York. Full charge and cost transparency. Easy, open website. You can make graphs. You can say, why does a C-section cost $4,000? at Montefiore Medical Center, statewide average is 6000 and you go to Mount Sinai, and it costs $12,000. And the quality is the same. I expect an angry call or two from Mount Sinai <laughs> and others. But we're going in that direction. It's important. We have to do this. Great transparency. That's next. Then the insurers will hate me, too. But you know what? I want to know what I'm paying for, what I get when I pay for it. And we have all the data. We have in the state of New York, by June 30th, we will have an all-payer claims database where every dollar spent, whether it's Medicare, Medicaid, all the private plans, will be in one data set that I have. And I'm going to set that free. We have in the state of New York all the clinical data from all the Rios being connected. That means you show up in a Brooklyn ER in a car accident, they can pull up your medical records from Buffalo. We set the interoperability standards with 19 other states, 21 EHR vendors, 22 HIE vendors, and as of last night, Northern Ireland signed on to these standards. The feds, we left them far behind. They, they, they just can't do anything, as you know. So transparency is happening. What would you do if you had all this data? the data from the clinical side, the data from the claim side. Maybe you'd do what Ga Kaiser's doing or Geisinger's doing. For 19.6 million New Yorkers, I'll leave that to you researchers. So lowering costs. We know today that uh, there are 80,000 ICU beds in the country filled and consuming 
0.8% of our GDP. We know today that 1% of patients cost us 21% of our healthcare dollar, 5%, 50% uh, of our dollar, 10% cost us about 75% of our healthcare dollars. And if you look at the other end of the spectrum, 50% of the least expensive patients cost us only 2% of our healthcare dollar. We have to get off this hamster wheel of fee-for-service. It isn't working. Everyone is gaming the system. And who's losing? The patients. And us as a society. So we've committed to an end of fee-for-service for our Medicaid program. And we are going to value-based purchasing. This is a big deal. 40% of the healthcare spend in the state of New York is Medicaid, 40%. And by the way, we have another million patients who are state health employees or municipal or local government employees for whom we are the purchasers. Oh, and by the way, we have an exchange now in our Department of Health, which in three years, if everything goes right now, will have another 1.1 million insurers. So we have a little opportunity here as a purchaser to change the nature of the game. What am I going to invest in? I'm already starting to invest in supportive housing. Supportive housing is basically housing with a little of substance abuse treatment or mental health services or other services built in. Why? Because I know today that Medicaid pays $755 a day for an inpatient stay, pays $459 a day for inpatient psychiatry, we pay, as a society, $129 a day for jail. We pay $68 a day for a homeless shelter and $48 a day for supportive housing. Housing is health care. Medicaid should pay. And we have spent hundreds of millions of state share only dollars on it so, so far. And we've asked the feds for a billion dollars to build up supportive housing. And they said no. We don't pay for bricks and mortar. Oh, yes, you do if it's called a nursing home. And you trap people in there who don't need a nursing home, but there's no supportive housing units for it. No answer to that. We have, uh, with one of the clinical scholars, a uh, piece coming out on supportive housing in the New England Journal in a few weeks. <coughs> really opportunities there. Water fluoridation, public health, every dollar that we put into water fluoridation saves the Medicaid program $14 in children's dental bills. Medicaid should pay for water fluoridation. Absolutely, and we're doing it. Nurse Family Partnership Program. Send a nurse into the home of a first-time mom on the Medicaid program every month through her pregnancy and for two years after. Sounds like a good idea. Well, there have been 33 years of randomized trials on this, going back, starting in Elmira, New York. It works. It improves outcomes for the kid. It improves outcomes for the mom. It increases interpregnancy spacing. It decreases abortion rates. It increases moms going back to work. It decreases special ed costs. It decreases juvenile justice rates. Every dollar spent on the Nurse Family Partnership Program saves society $5.70. We're going to put $100 million into, support, uh, into the Nurse Family Partnership Program. Why? Because I want to save $570 million. And by the way, it's the right thing to do. There's so many examples of that. One of my favorite examples is with the Clean Air Act. In the 1960s, Congress in their wisdom, passed the Clean Air Act. You know, you got to put little filters on smokestacks and reduce your emissions. Makes sense. That cost, an EPA did a study of the costs and benefits of the Clean Air Act between 1950 and, uh, sorry, 1970 and 1990. And they saw that it cost industry a total of half a trillion dollars to mitigate all that output. And the benefits from a health perspective were $22 trillion. There were 186,000 deaths averted every year 
because of the Clean Air Act. We're talking COPD or CHF, you know, asthma, all of that. We're talking 850,000 fewer asthma attacks a year, 674,000 decreased bronchitis cases, um, and 22 million days of work that would have otherwise been lost, saved because of the Clean Air Act. Health in all policies. A lot more was done outside of the four walls of the hospital, outside our traditional healthcare delivery system for our health collectively. But we had to think bigger. We had to think differently. So we are focusing more on outcomes. We are focusing on more on value. You know, we know that now I have the data with our Medicaid data warehouse. I can say, why is every patient showing up who was in a nursing home with a uh, grade two pressure ulcer showing up in a hospital with a grade three pressure ulcer. And you know, we, we have the dollars and cents to back that up. Well, we went out to the community and we asked them. And we spent a million dollars on a learning collaborative around pressure ulcer reduction. And we figured out that nursing homes and ambulances and hospitals all grade pressure ulcers differently. We got them speaking the same language. And in the first year alone, we averted thousands of pressure ulcers because they were finally being treated appropriately. And by the way, that million dollars, we <coughs> saved $28 million. <laughs> A long way to go still. Um, Preterm elective C-sections before 39 weeks. If you want to keep a NICU busy, let those C-sections happen before 39 weeks. It's clear. And why do they happen before 39 weeks? Oh, I've got a golf game to go to as a doc. Mom feels like it's a lucky day for her. Uh, the, the OR was open. I scheduled it. Didn't want to go late. Just go early. 100 bad reasons. We reduced it by 10% in one year in the state of New York, just by talking about it, saying, what the heck are you doing here? We haven't even banned it like Texas. But we were thinking about it. Another example, elective percutaneous coronary interventions, right? They balloon and stent in your heart vessels. Well, how many guess, what's your best guess on the inappropriate rate of elective PCIs in the state of New York? Anyone? 10%, okay. This is New York. <laughs> Not 45, 23%. 23% of P elective PCIs done in the state of New York, these invasive procedures where they put in balloons and stents, were inappropriate according to National American Heart Association guidelines two years ago. So I went on the road, gave a lot of speeches, and said, I'm not going to pay a penny for them. Figure it out. Fill your cath labs with underserved women and minorities and everyone else who needs them, who you aren't bothering to treat, but don't fill them inappropriately. Today, that rate has gone from 23% to 8%. I haven't withheld a single dollar because it's hard to change things, <laughs> but that alone, 8%. We could do that in 50 other areas. Prostate cancer, anyone? You know, we should do that in 50 other areas. Sepsis, the number one killer in hospitals across the country. What is sepsis? Ah, uh, it's a dirty diagnosis. These people are sick. We don't know what they're going to die of. We're just going to call it sepsis. You know, whatever. In April of 2011, Rory Staunton, a 12-year-old boy, healthy, cut his arm in gym died of sepsis two days later, NYU Medical Center, my alma mater. I know the ER doc. She's fantastic. It's a systems problem. It's a complex systems problem. The ER points to the lab. Our lactate was stat, but it was behind 50 other stat lactates. The, la the ICU points to the wards. They didn't pick it up fast enough. Everyone points to each other. And what do we know? We know that using checklists, 
simple protocols for the early diagnosis and aggressive management of sepsis can reduce sepsis deaths by between 30 to 60 percent. You will save lives. Kaiser's done it. North Shore LIJ has done it. Many systems have done it. So with Rory's death, I got away with a mandate, an unfunded mandate on the hospitals. Every hospital in the state of New York must use an evidence-based protocol for the early diagnosis and treatment of sepsis approved by the Department of Health. All 220 submitted them by September, and January 1st it's going to go into effect, and that's going to save 8,000 lives a year conservatively. Why do we, as a government, have to step in to change culture? No one else is strong enough sometimes. You know, in the state of New York, today, last year, 48.6% of healthcare workers in hospitals had their annual flu shot. Less than half. Annual flu shot. And in the s nursing homes, much worse. I know, I run four nursing homes. And one of my nursing homes had a 9% rate of annual flu shots. Rhode Island came up with a great idea. Why don't we mandate healthcare workers must get a flu shot? Great idea. They got some national awards on it. And then the 1199 SEIU union sued them and they're mired in litigation and the policy's gone nowhere. So last season, end of December, the lieutenant governor gave the flu to the secretary and two other staff members close to the governor. It was bad. January 1st or 2nd, the governor's like, Nirav, I really need my flu shot. I was like, oh. It's January, Governor. I was like, I need a flu shot. So we went on TV, gave him his flu shot. There was a run on the flu shots in the state of New York. Uh, we did, undid what Jenny McCarthy did in like overnight. And that opened up a policy window. I've been having breakfasts regularly with the president of 1199 SEIU visiting nurses association, you know, other breakfast diplomacy. And I said, why don't we, governor, mandate that health care workers first do no harm? Why don't we mandate that they wear masks if they don't want to get a flu shot or they can't get a flu shot? Just a mask, protect themselves, protect their families, and protect their immunocompromised patients who shouldn't be going to a hospital and getting the flu. That sounds like a reasonable policy. And so I took Rhode Island's policy, which was actually a mandate to either get a shot or a mask, but they called it a flu shot uh, mandate, made it much stricter, extended it to visitors, to you know, everyone under the sun, the back office staff who never see a patient, uh, volunteers, um, home visitor, uh, home workers, home care workers, and called it a flu mask mandate and got a unanimous vote of the governing council of 1199 SEIU in support of this and a quote from George Gresham and a quote from the visiting nurses in favor of this. And an uh, editor, uh, edi uh, perspective in JAMA with Art Kaplan on the ethics of a flu mask mandate. <laughs> and we know that in two years, if you look at systems that have done this, like Virginia Mason or many others, your flu shot rates, annual flu shot rates, are going to be 94%. In my nursing home where we in instituted this policy, it went from 9% to 62%. And it's going to go even higher. We can do this. There is a, an important role for government in it advancing the, the debate. There's a lot more I want to talk about, but I want to open it up to questions. So I want to end with one more story. It's a great story. I met this guy, Dr. Jack Geiger, a few weeks ago, and he's become one of my personal heroes. 45 years ago in Mississippi, Dr. Geiger opened one of the first federally qualified health centers, or community clinics. And time and again, he would see hungry mothers and their children walk in. After a while, Dr. Geiger started writing prescriptions for food. 
and local grocers would fill these prescriptions for food and send the bill to the clinic. Nervous bureaucrats, my predecessors, asked Dr. Geiger, you know, we, we really want you to stick to established treatments here in this clinic. And to this, the good doctor replied, last time I learned in medical school, the best treatment for malnutrition is food. <laughs> so let's focus on how we can return to focusing on health not health care, and work on it together. Thank you very much. We have time for questions. If anyone has one, uh, please just stand up or, yes. Hi, I'm Marty Trudeau from the VA Center for Health Equity Research and Promotion. Sure. Um, the VA, as you know, has been universal health care for many, many years. Um, it also has had an electronic medical record for well over a decade. But with the whole, uh, so my question for you is, how um, did you use the VA as any kind of reference point in um, determining what what actions you would take? And do you know why the um, VA was not used more as a reference point in the development of the ACA? I don't know the answer to why the VA wasn't used. I assume it's related to bureaucracies and perceptions of government versus the private sector. I know that the VA has been a model for me personally. I trained most of my training at uh, uh, the West Haven VA in uh, New Haven and afterwards my office was at the VA next door to Bellevue for many years. Um, and it is an outstanding system. It shows the possibility of what you could do when you hold people accountable, but then give them the tools they need for continuous quality improvement. And so we absolutely use the VA as a model. In fact, uh, all of this all-payer claims database and electronic health records are going to be blue button compliant by next summer. Give people their records in real time, however they want it. And that's another uh, great innovation from the VA. Um, the problem is, uh, and I referred to it earlier, people don't like government until they need it. <laughs> they call you a nanny state on one hand and then they demand that they have uh, you know, rules in place to keep their kids safe and, and everything, water safe and all. And so time and again what I try to do is just use the private sector to my benefit. So if, if the VA has done something and one private system has done the same thing, I can take that private system example and say, look at what they've done. And everyone will, you know, the VA did it 20 years ago. No one will listen. They did it. Kaiser did it. Oh, let's do it. Uh, that's why I hire McKinsey all the time, so that they can tell my bosses what I'm telling them. Right? It's the same, same thing. You, 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 you don't, you don't want to hear it straight from the government. You have to find a filter or a way to get there. Yes? Talk about creative solutions as it relates to social impact bonds and, and Rikers Island. Can you talk a little bit about the dire situation in Brooklyn, especially in a state like New York with an arcane regulatory environment, especially relating to private capital in hospitals? Yeah. So, for some of you who may uh, not have heard the story, in Brooklyn we have about a thousand extra beds, hospital beds. We have all these uh, not for profit hospitals that have not invested in their capital for decades. You know, I was in Brookdale Hospital, and it looks like you're entering the 19th century. I'm talking about their ICU, where it's about this big, and there's about eight beds lined up. There's no curtains. There's not, I mean, it's unbelievable what the conditions are. And that's because they haven't invested for 50 years in any infrastructure. Now, they also have 40% of their emergency room visits are ambulatory sensitive which means people are showing up in the ER and ending up inside when they could have been treated elsewhere if we only had a primary care delivery system that actually people wanted to go to that was open late at night that was you know so we're investing heavily in building out primary care in those areas and showing what high quality primary care can mean it can mean that it's open evenings and weekends that they use electronic health records that the doctor you know is there or that someone who knows you is there. That it actually meets your needs versus you show up in an ER, wait six hours, and they'll meet your needs. So that kind of culture change doesn't happen overnight. You need to build it, you need to have it there for a while, and, and then over time it'll work. On the other hand, a lot of the primary care that exists today 
is by those financially unsound institutions. So when they go down, all the little primary care left is also going away. And so with New York, not a single private dollar in hospitals, how do you undo that billion dollar, two billion dollars in the hole and not only undo that debt, but then go forward and make investments? We've tried to advance public-private partnerships, bills in the legislature saying, let someone come in, if they're willing, invest up to 49% in a hospital. So you still have the nonprofit mission, but you have the accountability and the finances of the private side, and somehow make a go at it. And to date, the legislature has said, no thanks. And so where are we left today? We're in trouble. <laughs> That's all I can, I mean, there, there's no easy answers there. In the very way back. So I'm wondering, from your perspective, why do you think uh, hospitals have had such, not the profit hospitals in particular, have had such a hard time uh, defining and implementing public health or community benefit initiatives? Um, and could you foresee a time when some of these hospitals that, if for the next five years they're not able to effectively implement programs like that, where they might be in danger of losing part or all of their tax protection. We are in such a hard time for hospitals right now. I mean, my friends and, and you know, the trustees and others, they want to do the right thing. But they know today they live in a fee-for-service world. And so what the hard part is, you have to live today in a fee-for-service world where you need to fill the beds to keep profitable, but you need to build the infrastructure simultaneously to live in a value-based world. You need to invest in electronic health records. You need to understand claims. You need to understand what are the levers outside your four walls that will ultimately lower readmissions. And then enter into a shared savings global capitation agreement with enough insurers so that it's worth your while to keep your hospital beds empty and flip the switch at the right time. It's really hard. And I have probably 20% of the CEOs, okay, I'll be nice, 5% of the CEOs of New York State hospitals were like, I've got five years, three years till retirement. I'm not going to do all that hard work. Let's just keep going with fee-for-service. Let's milk it to the last second, and then I'm out of here, right? It's hard. It's not, you, you have to invest. You have to build teams. You have to break down barriers between doctors and nurses. And it, it's, it's a whole system you have to change simultaneously. Places like Montefiore Medical Center, where to date, the 80% the of their money comes from Medicaid or Medicare. They've had to figure it out decades ago. And so they and some other ACOs are very well positioned to do that. So we have shining stars like the Kaisers, which is not generalizable, and the uh, Montefiores and others. And then we have a big middle, and then we have really weak, fragile hospitals. I, I, every week I get a call from somewhere in rural New York with a hospital that says I have two days cash on hand or two weeks cash on hand I don't know what to do we're gonna just hand you the keys and that catastrophic closure could have been averted and what do they really need they need a urge center 24-hour urge center 12 hours of that is ER they need more primary care and they need networks and connections to regional centers of excellence, hospitals, substance abuse treatment, all of that, that's not, I mean, I know what they need, but getting from where we are today to where they, what they need to be tomorrow, and there's no money to get there, by the way. That's been the continual challenge. That's what keeps me up at night. Back there. So we talked a lot about transparency, and um, when you have data, data, data from public health insurance is relatively easy to come by. Not that it's easy, but relative to private insurance is relatively easy to come by. Um, are there any any things you've seen in your dealings with the with the public with the uh, public insurance sector that can maybe maybe be applicable to savings in the private insurance sector where data is not transparent, uh, you know, they have shareholders and there's there's uh, some sort of perverse incentives with health uh, between health and I think that there are lessons to be learned from the pri uh, public side. And, and one of the things that I've learned is you never add more work to people. You take work away net. So when we go, in 2011 when I started, 
uh, I walked a bill through the Assembly and through the Senate for this all-payer claims database that mandated the reporting of data and from all, all payers. And what I said is we're going to stick to national standards and we're going to reduce your reporting requirements on these other things that you would otherwise have to do because now we have an all-payer claims database. We can figure out how to get our own information instead of asking for four times. So we'll net reduce your burden and we're going to stick to national standards so that it's not, you're not reinventing the wheel for every state. They agreed to that, right? And every, there are so many places where that's an example. Look at quality reporting. You go to NQF and Joint Commission and uh, NCQA and the feds want something different and Meaningful Use wants something different and the states all want something different. It's painful. It's unproductive. No one's using the data to its full extent. Instead of 500 measures, let's pick five or ten that matter and work on them together. But then getting NCQA and Joint Commission to agree, it's hard. <laughs> Give up some power. But that's our job. We can do that. If we can articulate the case for that, we can actually make the world better and easier and cheaper and all uh, simultaneously. So that's a, a strategy that we've used time and again. We're going to reduce your burden, by the way. People don't say no to that. Yes? Speaking of data, so far, how are the HRRs in New York doing on the Dartmouth Atlas type of thing? So how are the HRRs doing on the Dartmouth Atlas? Well, you know, all of this change uh, can't happen overnight. And over time, um, it will improve. I'm, I'm an optimist. I kind of have to be to be in this job. And the, the reality is the total cost of care savings are one-offs. They're very few examples of it. We can't go generalize across the state. We still have 50% of our doctors not using electronic health records in those 1Z and 2Z you know, practices. How are we going to shift them to value-based payment models? It's a big divide. We, we're actually coming out this week with a plan on how to do that. And it requires a billion dollars. 60 million from CMMI as a SIM grant, but ultimately it'll cost us a billion dollars to move all those small practices into advanced primary care models. I'm not calling it NCQA um, because it's not going to be NCQA. It, it, it's, we're, it's not going to show the numbers. You're not going to see those improvements overnight. You're going to see them over time. Yes? Um, so you sometimes feel that there is an inverse relationship between saving money on healthcare and improving the health of the patients. And uh, by this I mean, you know, the secret tax that's been recently implemented by New York State, which is, you know, supposed to, well, improve the health of patients uh, and save money also on, uh, you know, Medicare and Medicaid, but 70 or 80 years, or 60 or 70 years down the line, it's actually going to cost the healthcare even more because you have more people who are healthy and who are living to be able to benefits. So the question is, is it actually cost effective to let people live longer, healthier lives? <laughs> That's a good question. I mean, is that not what you're asking? Yes, and the CBO did uh, you know, release reports which, you know, I mean, you see, you see benefits for the first four or five years, but then you see the cost of healthcare is actually. Yes, but by then they're all going to move to Florida. I like the ethicist to answer that, actually. But uh, honestly, I, I think that, you, you know, yes, the numbers are what they are. You, you, you prevent a cancer death, it's going to cost a lot later. But I'll give you another number. HIV. How much does preventing one HIV case cost? Lifetime medical costs for an HIV versus a non-HIV person, $397,000 difference. I think there's a big savings there. And by the way, it's the right thing to do. And so we're going to end the AIDS epidemic in New York State. We're going to invest in it. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sunny Hallowell. I'm from the Center for Health Outcomes and Policy Research at the School of Nursing here at Penn. And I had a conversation with a primary care provider recently where they discussed that nurse practitioners provide about 60% of the care um, in the health um, area that I work in. And I'm wondering, I know that you've done some work with your practitioners, and I'd like to know how you feel about uh, how you can resolve the issues in terms of their scope of practice within this data in New York. You've heard a lot about how nurses, 
nurses participate in primary care in the medical homes, and I would say that they do a lot of that care, and I'm wondering how you can resolve those practices. Again, I'm going to resolve the scope of practice issues by showing them the dollars and cents, because that's something that everyone understands. And I'll give you an example. So today in the state of New York, doctors have the scope of practice and they don't let NPs do anything on their own without supervision and there's kickbacks to docs who, who hire NPs and all this horrible stuff going on. NPs do the same thing to PAs. PAs do the same thing down the line. It's across the whole system, okay? It's not just a doctor problem. It is a doctor problem but it happens everywhere. Scope of practice is being protected using the, the wrong reasons and the wrong arguments. Now what if a doctor actually practiced only at the top of her license? She'd make more money. How much more money? A lot more money. There is a practice in Westchester. I've been there twice now. This is one of those ACOs. They only take private money because, you know, it's Westchester. They don't need Medicaid or Medicare. So they've got a good insurance mix. 250 doctors. There are orthopods there. They have 80 or 90 different algorithms for care with armies of NPs and PAs doing the work. They're open early morning to late night, including weekends. They have CAT scanners and everything right next door, specialists in primary care. You go in, same day visit, you need a mammogram, you get it done, you get it read right then and there where I want to get cared for. Orthopod there has six active rooms at a, a time. Churning lots of money, but doing only what an orthopod needs to do because the PAs are doing whatever they can do and, and so on and the line. What does an average pediatrician make at West Med? 130,000 is the statewide average. At West Med, $700,000. I kid you not. I want to become a pediatrician and go work there, <laughs> right? It shows the power the, I mean, yes, they're doing everything right. They've got billing down to, they can tell you by payer what day they're going to be paid. They've got a 32-second response rate and resol resolution time on their call center in multiple language. I mean, they've got everything. It, it's, it's a dream, but it's a reality, too, today. And that's what a pediatrician makes? Forget scope of practice. I don't want to <laughs> worry about scope of practice. And yet, the AMA and other societies who are trying to keep that onesie and twosie practice alive don't know any other way to work. How do you get onesie and twosie practices to use an electronic health record if they missed out on the boat of meaningful use dollars? You know, you're going to invest $40,000 and have your practice disrupted for three months and maybe then you'll be able to compete or probably not? What's going to happen when Walgreens and others, the minute clinics come? and skim off all those high reimbursement procedures. That's happening already. So we can't defend the past anymore. If you're defending the past, you're not spending your time figuring out how you're going to live in the future. And we have made a commitment. We've advanced bills year after year. And hopefully this will be the year in New York where nurse practitioners can do more on their own. But remember, the Medical Society of the State of New York is the ninth biggest lobbyist in Albany. Yes, sir. Okay. So one of, the, um, one of the challenges with the Affordable Care Act was the uh, care at the end of life. And that is a source of uh, uh, drain of resources in some instances, but also a very challenging ethical area. What have we done in Europe? At the end of life in New York, as of 2010, we have a law that states that every provider must talk about options at the end of life. And the reality is very few do it. Almost none are equipped to do it. And every year, I fight off aggressive battles by Orthodox Jews who say that that law is being used to unplug grandma at Mount Sinai Hospital. So I'm just trying to fight to stay even. <laughs> I just want that law to stay on the books. That's what I'm working on. Obviously, we, were, we, we need to then take it to the next step and say doctors are ill-equipped to have these conversations. Maybe there's community health workers or others who can have different versions of this conversation to tee up the, the right conversations. Um, again, when we get six months from now to true total cost of care using an all-payer claims database, we will be able to say what is the opportunity cost of those 
three months at the end of life in an ICU on 17 medications with a PEG tube and a J tube. Is that what you want, by the way? No. We can actually have that conversation in different ways. And uh, I'm hopeful that that's going to happen soon. Yes. You mentioned the IT infrastructure, and you've inherited actually a very good situation with the heel grants, the ARA money, the CMMI, and so forth. What are the plans for maintaining and expanding that uh, and keeping up with the technology once those uh, big sources of funding uh, start to disappear? In the state of New York, we've invested over a billion dollars to get doctors to use electronic health records and then building up regional health information organizations and then ultimately tying them together. In this budget, November budget, governor's budget, I am making the strong argument that all of that data, whether it's EHR data or claims data, is a citizen's data. It's not the hospital's data. It's not the insurance company's data. It's your data. And if it's your data, we collectively should pay for it. And on a $6 billion HICRA tax on hospitals and institutions, this would be 1% to maintain all of that. Makes sense to me. We should spend 1%. And so that's my strategy. As of this budget, we'll have sustainable funding for both the statewide EHR network, the Shiny, and the All Payer Claims Database. We're going to, I'm going to. DOH, government, trust me, I'm the government, is going to connect all that data sets together with uh, hundreds of other data sets that we have, de-identify it and give it away. And for researchers, we're going to deputize you as part of the Department of Health and say, I, this is a public health emergency. I need you to use the identifiable data to answer these five questions. And by the way, we're going to pay you for that too because we've, we're on track to save $34 billion in Medicaid. We've requested $10 billion from the feds in uh, 1115 Medicaid waiver and we're getting very positive signs that it's delayed but it will be approved in the next few months which means we will be able to go to the street and say we need you to do this by the way here's money for that yes I think I have time for maybe one or two more questions one last question I'm not in favor of all of those being bought out by hospitals or ACOs or, frankly, insurance companies. I don't think that's the right answer. But if you ask Art Kaplan, he says that to be a sole practitioner today is unethical. Unethical. Because you can't provide accountable care. You can't provide continuous quality improvement and all the other things you need to do. So that's Art's view. You know, Art is Art. On the other hand, there are good examples of practices that are independent practices banding together, the Cayuga Regional Medical Group is independent practices who have all agreed and signed an MOU to share data and so all their payers give them a back-end dashboard so they can compare themselves against their peers in terms of quality and outcomes and processes and, and engage in the kind of work that otherwise systems would do but yet they're independent. So there's, there's you, you know, it's not all or none. There are models out there that are working where you can get the benefits and the accountability and the continuous quality improvement without giving up your autonomy. I don't think it's an autonomy versus uh, accountability. I think you can have both. I think we're done. Well,